faster than you may be in. And I'm going to read to you from the citation that President Adam Fox read when Ethan Zuckerman, class of 1993, received the Bicentennial Medal at Williams College in 2014. He begins, We forgive you, Ethan. Yes, you invented the pop-up ad. But, perhaps because being married to a rabbi, you have spent the rest of your life atoning. <laughs> In the first dot-com wave, you helped develop the Williams-based startup Tripod, the first company to make it easy to post on the web. <laughs> Combining your love of Africa, technology, and social change, you then founded Peak Corps, which mobilized volunteers to help build computer infrastructures in developing countries. You co-founded the Citizen Media Reporting Network Global Voices Online, that has become, in a way, the conscience of the internet. Bring to you Ethan Zuckerman. Oh. Well, thanks, Peter. Thank you, everybody. The reason I put a stool out here was that I, I didn't really want to give a lecture. I sort of wanted to see if I could spark a conversation. Uh, but in the spirit of doing so, I, I'll, I'll tell a couple of stories and, and see if I can live up to um, uh, Peter's encouragement to sort of talk about uh, what I'm thinking, what I'm praying, and what I'm doing about climate change. And, and the answer is, from my perspective directly, as someone who studies media and, and someone who really studies internationalism, not much within that direct frame. But a problem that I'm working on, which is the problem um, of, of how we listen to each other, and particularly how we listen to each other uh, across border, across language, and across culture, I think it's one of the problems that we actually have to take on if we want to take this notion of creation care seriously. Um, so I wanted to start uh, by telling a story about football, uh, and, and not the sort of football that like guys my size play and get concussions while they do it, uh, but the sort of round ball sort of football that the rest of the world plays. Uh, and for me, it's a story that starts 22 years ago uh, in Accra, Ghana, uh, I was 20 years old. I had just graduated from Williams. Uh, I had just been invited uh, to start studying at the University of Ghana at Legong. Um, and so I went over to Accra. I was apartment hunting, trying to figure out where I was going to live. I'd arrived in town on a Friday night, and I got up Saturday morning, and I decided to start walking around and just getting a sense for where I was. And where I was was this giant, sprawling city that was apparently completely depopulated. Uh, because I would walk the streets and I would run into absolutely nobody. And finally, after about 20 minutes, I turned a corner and I found 400 people sitting outside under a tent watching a 12-inch black and white television. Uh, and as I said hi to a couple of people, I started to figure out what was going on. And what was going on was the JBC Under 18th Youth Football Championship, where Ghana and Nigeria were facing off against one another. It was the final. Ghana lost, but Ghana mostly lost because most of the Nigerian under-18 players were in their 30s. But it was a really good game, despite the fact that this everybody was crowded around this television, and this television was attached to a car battery. And that was not uncommon in Ghana at that time. If you wanted to bring people together, if you wanted to have a church service, if you wanted to, to watch television, people were hauling around automotive batteries, putting them in a field, and sort of setting up, and this was where power came from. Now, this was really strange. Because I didn't know a lot about Ghana, but one thing that I knew about Ghana was that for all the nations in West Africa, Ghana was the most rich in electricity. And the reason for this is that when Kwame Nkrumah led Ghana to independence in 1957, he had a vision of Ghana not being dependent on the West for aid, but being an industrial power. And part of this vision for being an industrial power was producing aluminum. Ghana's soil is filled with bauxite, uh, which is the aluminum ore. And what you need to turn bauxite into aluminum 
are smelters. And smelters require an enormous quantity of electricity, huge, huge, huge quantities of electricity. So Nkrumah looked at this new country that's just gotten independence from Britain, looked at the land of this country and said, you know what we're going to do? We're going to flood the east of the country. And built a dam called Akasumbo that ended up flooding one-eighth of the country's land area, displaced hundreds of thousands of people, but gave Ghana unparalleled hydroelectric power, more than anybody else in the region. And what everyone knew about Ghana in 1993 when I moved there was this was a country in West Africa where if you wanted to set up a factory, if you wanted to run a business, you could do it here. But electricity was not for ordinary people. And so in the neighborhoods where I was walking around, no one had bothered to wire those neighborhoods for electricity for a very simple reason. People were living on about a dollar a day, $300 a year. No one was going to have the money to buy the television or to pay the electric fees. No one figured that this was where the audience was going to be for electric power. So, at this moment in time, lots of electricity, sustainable electricity. Sustainable electricity with a horrific personal and, and economic cost. And I know folks from the east of Ghana who will, will never forgive Kwame Nkrumah may rest in peace for flooding their land, but a really interesting model for where a nation might go. So let's fast forward now. Ghana this spring was involved with another football championship. This one's called the Africa Cup of Nations. This is one of those tournaments that happens in the off year for the World Cup. It's a big deal. Ghana's in the finals again. They lose again. This happens a lot, this time to Cote d'Ivoire, this time in penalty shootouts. Here's the thing. Everybody now, in 2015, is watching this match. They're watching it, for the most part, in their air-conditioned homes, or in bars, which are also air-conditioned. They're watching on big-screen plasma TVs. They're no longer powering off of car batteries, they're powering off of the grid, but there's something really interesting about the grid. Ghana is totally out of power. In fact, the main thing going on in Ghana right now is something called Dum Sor. And you guys probably don't speak Chui, but Dum <laughs> is on, Sor is off. So Dum Sor is just sort of what's going on these days. It goes on and off, on and off, on and <laughs> off. In technical terms, this is called load shedding. This is what you do with an electric grid when you don't have enough power to keep it going. And so you turn it off in one neighborhood, you turn it on in another neighborhood, except for moments where you know that you need electricity to be on throughout the entire country. And when Ghana is facing off against Cote d'Ivoire <laughs> in the finals of the Africa Cup of Nations, if you are a sane Ghanaian politician, you understand that job one is to ensure that everybody in the nation is capable of watching this football match in air-conditioned comfort. So Ghana does a couple of things. They start buying power from their neighbors, from Cote d'Ivoire, from Togo, from Burkina Faso. They start pulling in power ships. I didn't even know these things existed, but it turns out these are things invented by GE for World War II. They are floating power plants on a barge that you tow into place. And so two of these 75 megawatt power ships were towed right outside of Accra and sort of dock to basically throw a line and provide people with power so that people were capable of watching this football game. So what happened in 22 years? Two things happened. One is predictable, and one is actually kind of a surprise. The first one is that Ghana got a lot bigger. Ghana was about 17 million people when I moved there 20 years ago. It's 25 million people now. Accra, which was a bustling little city of a million, is almost three million now. But populations grow. And in fact, we know that around the world, population growth is primarily in very poor countries. This is because of differences in birth rates. You have a low replacement rate in many, many large, wealthy countries. You're well above replacement rate in much poorer countries. The thing that was much less predictable is that Ghana got really rich. And not really rich like rolling in it really rich, but really rich in the difference between a dollar a day and five dollars a day. Because that's what's happened in 22 years in Ghana. The GDP per capita went from $300 to $1,800. 
And the difference between a dollar a day and five dollars a day is the difference between 400 people sitting in a tent and watching a football game and people sitting in their homes watching a football game. Five dollars a day is a level at which people buy televisions, they buy fans, some of them end up buying air conditioning, a lot of them are buying cars. At five dollars a day, you're buying it mostly as a business investment, you're probably running a taxi service. But it's an enormous difference from where we are at a dollar a day. And what's interesting is that as we're watching people around the world have this progress that comes from development, have this wonderful freedom to make more choices about their lives, right? Amartya Sen, probably the smartest guy of our generation talking about development, talks about development as freedom. When you have a dollar a day, you are enormously constrained in your decision making. At a dollar a day, your problems are putting a roof over your children's heads and feeding them. At $5 a day, you're suddenly at a point where you can make some choices. How am I going to invest in higher education for my children? Are we going to invest in luxury goods? Are we going to have a bed? Are we going to have a metal roof? Are we going to have the television? Are we going to save up and buy the car? Are we going to move towards that standard of living that we expect to have everywhere else in the world? We are going through this remarkable moment. I often don't know whether people in a, in a country like ours really understand how much the world has changed in the last 20 years. Billions, somewhere between two and three billion people have moved out of abject poverty to this level of the emerging middle class. This is absolutely unprecedented. It is an incredible shift. It's not mostly in Sub-Saharan Africa. It's mostly in China. It's mostly in India. But Sub-Saharan Africa, where I've had friendships and relationships for 22 years, has gone on this astounding curve, where you literally have situations now that were not imaginable two decades before. But we also have to start looking at the consequences of these situations. So here's how Ghana works during Dumsor. Right? So during a moment where people have now invested money in televisions, in air conditioning, in nicer houses, when you walk the streets of Accra, you hear this sort of steady background hum. It sounds a lot like mosquitoes, except that you're used to what mosquitoes sound like because it's a malarial country and you already know about taking care of the mosquitoes. It's generators. Everybody is buying generators. I don't have the numbers for Ghana, I do have the numbers for Lagos, Nigeria, where 30,000 generators get purchased per month. Now, these are inexpensive generators. These are little generators, they're about you know, the size of two milk crates, they weigh about 100 pounds, they cost maybe $100, $150. They are ludicrously inefficient. They are a horrific, horrific thing to do in terms of carbon footprint but they are affordable to the people who want and need these things. There's another thing that starts going on when you walk the streets of Ghana late at night. I like walking across late at night because it cools off after about 11 p.m. It's a, it's a fun city. Actually, the best place to go is a night market that starts opening up around 11 p.m., goes until about 3 or 4 in the morning. When I go walk over to the night market, I've started to notice cars. They're running. Their lights are off. When you look inside them, three or four people are sleeping. And they're sleeping in their cars because it's much cheaper to air condition your car overnight than it is to air condition your house overnight. So now, instead of an electric grid, we have people burning you know, uh, either gas or diesel fuel on the streets as a way of trying to cool off. So when you look at this from an environmental perspective, you can look at this and say, this is horrific, we've got to stop this, this is a terrible way to go. But I, I want to ask you to look at this from an entirely different perspective. And the different perspective is this. We have found a way to live in this country that has an enormous carbon <coughs> footprint 
We know, because we've been told by very, very smart people over a long period of time, that if the rest of the world were to live the way that we do, it would require somewhere between five and ten planets worth of resources. Here is my message to you. Everybody's coming. <laughs> really, really, really fast. They're already there in many cases. The environmental footprint of a middle-class Canadian is still a whole lot lighter than the environmental footprint of an American. But the aspiration is very, very similar to the aspiration that people have in this country. And aspirations are incredibly powerful. When we look at how people have sort of followed a path to development, whether it's in Sub-Saharan Africa, whether it's in India, whether it's in China, it's had everything to do with living in a world where it is very, very easy to look and see what everyone else is doing. And so we may have been hoping for a different Chinese path or a different Indian path, but the path we are getting is the path basically coming out of California, out of both the tech and the entertainment industries. The biggest thing now in Ghana is one of the biggest things that I started seeing about 10, 15 years ago when I would go to Bangalore in India, which is US-style home subdivisions out of the outskirts of town, large, standalone, air-conditioned <coughs> houses on beautifully kept green lawns on cul-de-sacs. And the reason for this is that the people who are building these houses are engineers who are trained in the US, who have worked in the US, who have lived in the suburban US, and are now creating exactly the same sorts of communities, whether it's in Ghana, whether it's in Nigeria, whether it's in India, because we have created a set of aspirations that the rest of the world is subscribing to. So here is the interesting trick. I think a lot of us have gotten our heads around this idea that we can't live the way we were living. I think a lot of us have started making changes in that direction. I used to commute from here to Cambridge every day, not every day, but I'd go out on Tuesday and come out on Thursday driving the truck that I used to sort of maintain my house and do carpentry and so on and so forth. And I realized that I can't do that, and now I drive an itty-bitty little somewhat cramped diesel car that gets about three times as much gas mileage. And I can pat myself on the back because I'm using half as much, but I haven't radically altered my, my way of life. That's not going to swing it. We need a 10x shift. If there's any way to allow the five billion people who haven't yet made a shift, who haven't yet had that opportunity to experience a middle class lifestyle, to have the things that actually we want people to have. Because I want people to have televisions, and I want them to have air conditioning, I want them to have the choices that I've had growing up in this country. But it means that we have to find a way to do it with about as tenth of the resources that we've used to do it, because we need our footprint to be about half the weight, but we now need that footprint to be applicable to five times as many people. So that's the first piece of bad news. Here's the second piece of bad news. This can't feel like a step back, because what we are saying to people around the world who are well aware that they have not had the opportunities that you and I have had sitting in this room, is that we are saying two things. We want them to have a better future. We want them to have an aspirational future. But we want them to do it in a way where we are not all collectively moving to self-destruction. And I do not think it is a reasonable thing for us to come to the world as the wealthiest and sort of most resource-laden nation on the planet and essentially say, you know that last hundred years that we've had, sorry, we, we really screwed that up. We're changing our way of thinking about it. What we would like you to aspire to is much, much less than what we had. That's not going to work. And so what we need to start looking for is a future that looks better 
not just for people in the developing world, but for us. It's got to be an aspirational future at some level of resource use that is far, far below what we have now. So those are two enormous pieces of bad news, and now I want to sort of suggest two pieces of good news, or possible good news, or challenge associated with that good news. I think the first piece of that good news may come from the fact that I've just spent four years at MIT, um, which has a bad way of sort of messing up your head, because you're basically <laughs> surrounded by people who are convinced that they're going to invent their way to the future. But the interesting thing is that you often come across people who actually are inventing their way to the future. And we're starting to see what some of these technologies might look like. The revolution that we've had in this country around solar is utterly astounding. And again, this is sort of a, a, a situation of iteration. I drive the Mass Pike once a week in each direction, every <coughs> single week. And for those of you who do that, you will know that largely every piece of free space along that highway between, say, exit 9 and exit 14 is now being colonized with solar panels. Solar panels have gotten to a level of efficiency, they've got a level of price, they've got a level of install capacity, where the question suddenly becomes, are you losing money for not putting them on a piece of land? That's a very interesting moment when you have people literally sort of asking the question that people have been asking for wind for 10 years, can I afford not to do this? We have some technologies that are at a super early stage, and I think watching a company like Tesla is pretty fascinating for this. Here is a company that is absolutely trying for that aspirational market. Tesla's $70,000 electric car is a whole lot nicer <coughs> than the, uh, the diesel Volkswagen that I'm driving at the moment. And it's a little out of my reach at this point, but it probably is within my reach in five years. And that promise of saying, you're going to have an electric car, and you know what, you're actually going to like it a whole lot more than the vehicle you were driving previously, is the sort of argument that we can actually make in a world like this. And it is not coincidental that Tesla is now thinking about batteries that you put in store in your home. Because the vision for this is a vision in which your roof is solar cells, you are charging a bank of batteries, that bank of batteries is charging your car, you're simply not paying for fuel anymore. And to one extent or another, you are now at a point where you have a lifestyle which is more sustainable, and if anything, significantly better than what you're experiencing before. So that's one piece of good news. The bad news about it is that, like most futures, it's extremely unevenly distributed at this point. It's a future that my boss, who makes a whole lot more than I do at MIT, has a very, very nice Tesla in the garage. I don't yet. And there's a whole lot of other people who may be 10 or 20 years further off. But there's another piece to this vision. There's a piece to this vision that I hadn't realized before I came here this morning, but it actually connects very neatly to Pentecost, and particularly to the reading that we had before in Acts. Because if we want to think about this future, we want to think about a future that is a tenth as harmful to the planet, that is scalable to everybody on the planet, it's not going to be a matter of taking these models that we've had in the U.S. and simply applying them to everybody else. Whether we're doing it consciously or doing it unconsciously, that is the path that we're going through now. What we need is a much broader conversation. And that conversation can't start from the scolding position of, we've screwed up, please help us now save the planet. The conversation has to start from this place where we say, what do you want, what do you need, and what do you deserve? What are your aspirations? For the 25 million people living in Ghana, the 180 million people living in Nigeria, the 1.2 million people living in India, the 1.3 billion living in China, 
what are you dreaming about? Because that's the future we have to start finding a way to come together and build it. And it's a future that's going to involve the bleeding edge of technology that's happening in a place like MIT. It's also going to involve the bleeding edge of technology happening in China and happening in India. But it's also going to involve models and ways of living and ways of thinking about how we use space and how we interact with one another that are significantly different from the models that we're <coughs> using in this country right now. If we scale even just the way we use land in this country, that is not a model that's going to work in Bangladesh. It's not <laughs> going to work in Myanmar. It's not going to work for much of the world. And so the question is, how do we open up that conversation? And that's the issue that I've been working on for at least 10 years. Because I come from the internet, and one of the big hopes that we had for the internet 20 odd years ago was that the internet was Pentecost. It was the moment <laughs> at which we would all come together and have one conversation. And we would understand each other. That somehow through this technological shift, we would all be able to speak to each other in, each other, in, in our own languages. And that hasn't proven to be the case. <laughs> that what's happened instead is we have this extraordinary technology that is very, very good at letting us talk to ourselves. <laughs> when you think about some of the things that we've built, when you think about what has now become the dominant way that most people use these tools, which is Facebook, this is a tool that is very much designed for us to surround ourselves with the people that we already know, we already love, and we already listen to. Some of you may not even remember signing up for Facebook. I will remind you what happens when you sign up for Facebook. I try it every couple of months just to remind myself. When you sign up for Facebook, the first thing it does is says, where did you grow up? Where did you go to elementary school? Where did you go to high school? Where have you worked? Where do you go to church? What it's asking you are the sorts of questions we ask each other. Mm -hmm. Who are you? Who are your people? Who do you know? What's my common ground with you? And Facebook does this because it knows that if we find 10 friends, we're going to stay on that platform. We're going to keep talking to them. But what it means is that it's a very good tool for reinforcing who we already know. Facebook does a great job of keeping me in touch with the people that I went to high school with, whether or not I want to be in touch with them. <laughs> but Facebook has never asked me if I would like to meet someone exciting from Nigeria. Facebook has never asked me if I wanted to have a conversation with someone in China about climate change. Facebook has never asked me to listen to someone in India talk about what they want, what they need, what they dream about. And so what I want to suggest is that what we need is not just an amazing revolution of technology. It's not just better solar cells and better electric cars and better batteries. It's a revolution of listening. It's a revolution of figuring out how do we find a way to have a conversation with people around the world about what they want, what they need, what they dream about, and what they deserve? Because when we think about problems at a global scale, climate change, creation care, whatever language we use for this, this is a problem that we cannot solve by talking to the people who we already know to talk about. This is a problem that we only solve by finding a way to have a conversation that is actually global in scale and in scope. This is a conversation that we only can have if we can find that way to think about that miraculous <coughs> moment where we're all speaking and we're all hearing and we're all finding a way to listen and understand one another. And for me, that's the challenge that I want to put my time into and that I want to think about. 
So having said I wanted this to be a conversation, I am now lectured for at least half an hour, but I am still sitting here in a room which would allow us to have a conversation. So why don't I shut up and let us talk, please. You have given us a paradigm of sh shifting thinking. Marvelous. I hope that wire leads to a tape recorder, <laughs> because otherwise it's been lost. I think the camera staring straight at me <laughs> is not so much an attempt to turn this into an Orwellian space of surveillance, but is it's to hold on to this A chance to read back over your CR and summarize is a way to start, I think. Thank you very much. Please. Um, I, um, I take in very much what you're saying, and uh, especially about communication. And uh, I, I applaud the internet as a, as a means of global communication, bringing people together uh, for good or for bad. I have some worries about it, and I'll just toss them out. Um, it's, it's a way of connecting, but it's also a way of disconnecting. And you're saying that to a degree. Um, <clears throat> I feel that we're moving more and more toward living in a virtual world and less and less in a real physical world. <clears throat> and I worry about what me that means to human beings <clears throat> in terms of isolation, uh, <clears throat> lack of physical and spiritual contact that you could only have face to face, and a kind of disconnect from the natural world. I see people out walking in the woods with their cell phones, I see them in art museums taking pictures of paintings rather than looking at the painting itself. Um, everything needs to be somehow recorded or seen through a screen or texted because it takes too much time for an email and it's not for a bit a phone call or a face-to-face -face meeting. Uh, and I, I worry about the implications of this for climate change, because if you're so disengaged with the rest of humanity and the natural world, it's always going to be an abstract problem, not a real one. So, um, to, to misquote Shakespeare, I, I, I come not to praise the internet, but to bury it. I, I, you know, the, the funny thing is sort of 22 years into sort of my work on technology and social change, I've, I've actually become pretty critical of this medium that, that I end up working in. Um, my critique is, is not a one-to-one -one map onto yours, but there's a lot of common ground with it. Uh, the things that I'm afraid about in the internet largely have to do with putting blinders on what we see and what we hear and, and what we listen to. Uh, and for me, I'm at least as concerned with, with, with who we're listening to as, as listening to the environment or listening to our surroundings. But the challenge that I do want to put forward for you is, is sort of the one that I've been trying to solve um, now for a very long time. Um, about 15 years ago, I got very interested in this question of how could I help the people that I cared about in the developing world and that very quickly turned into a question of how did I help people understand what was actually going on in the countries that I was working in. And clearly the easiest way to do this was to put people on airplanes. And, and the problem is it doesn't scale. It doesn't scale financially. It doesn't scale fiscally. And the thing that's interesting about media, the thing that's very rewarding about media, is that if you do it well, Someone can tell you a story, someone can make you a film, someone can show you a photo that can help you have that layer of empathy and compassion for someone who's living somewhere very, very different. So I don't want to throw out these tools. I think they're too powerful, and I think particularly when we think about the question of how do we have a conversation, how do we understand someone coming from a radically different place, there's so much potential to use these tools well. But I agree with you that there are many, many ways in which we're using these tools very poorly, and that we're often using them to isolate ourselves from each other, from the world around us, and that when we are staring into the screen, a lot of the time we're staring into the wrong screen. We're staring into the screen that makes us comfortable, 
We're staring into this screen that keeps us connected to the same group of people all the time. We're not staring into the screen that challenges us. But for me, for my work, it's not right now about moving away from that screen. It's about changing. It's about changing how we use it and changing what we put on it. It seems that what you're hoping for as a woman as wonderful as it sounds, is, is pretty idealistic. Um, because you're talking about the whole world and going around and talking to everybody in the whole world and asking them what they want. And uh, you're not asking them what I would ask them first is who can do the things that you want in your country or in your area? Because in your idealistic way, there may be nobody to do that unless you're counting, excuse me, unless you're counting on the United States to solve everybody's problem, or Russia to solve everybody's problem. So have you looked at it the other way? So, so to be really clear, the people that I'm working with are not looking for anyone else to solve their problems. Most of the people that I'm working with in the developing world are technologists, entrepreneurs, software developers. Uh, there are people in Kenya starting a business right now that is trying to give people home solar systems for $20. Now, $20 is cheap for a home solar system. They cost about $200. But the way the system works is that you get it installed, and you make a weekly payment from your mobile phone, because one of the things that Kenyans have built is a mobile money system that actually works. Uh, and you pay for about two years. At the end of two years, at the cost of what it was costing you to buy kerosene to light your house, you have a solar panel, you have three lights, you have uh, a plug for your mobile phone. Now this isn't being created by Americans. This is being created by Kenyans running a Kenyan business. To the extent that I'm able to be helpful around this, a lot of it, for me, starts from listening for the ways that people are coming up with these solutions locally. And to the extent that I have a role in this, it's to take the privileged position I have as someone who's a teacher and someone who gets the chance to travel the world, and to take some of the inspiration, some of the incredible discoveries and steps forward being made in different parts of the world and bring them elsewhere. So I think your question is the right one. The question is, what do you want, and who is helping you get to it? And what I found in most of the world is that there's a surprising number of people who are working on getting to it. What I am surprised by is how infrequently these ideas move from place to place. And for me, that's where the opportunity is. So I was in Brazil three weeks ago, and I was in the slums of Rio, and I was talking to people in really bad Portuguese about this notion of could you get solar power in this neighborhood? And could you do it at the cost of 60 AR, which is a, a cost at which people could actually pay for it? And then they were saying, well, where is this? What's the American company that's going to get me there? And I have to say, it's a Kenyan company that's going to get you there. Uh, and then you have the problems we all have. You have racism. You have people essentially saying, wait, you want to bring African technology to Brazil? What's wrong with us? How primitive do we think we are? And, and, and my response was, no, this is the best stuff in the world today. But those are the conversations that are hard to have. Those conversations where we look for those possible futures and we're finding them in every corner of the world and bringing them together. And those, for me, are the conversations that, for me, are most exciting. Sir? Is there a point of no return, though, in the environment when we passed it? I'm not a climate scientist. I'm not a geologist. I'm as terrified as I think many of us are. Um, I follow some of my friends who study ice cores and who are looking at um, massive sea level rise. I think it's worth remembering <clears throat> that there have been other points of no return. If you look at industrialization in Britain in the late 1800s, you had moments where Pollution was so bad, there was so much soot, 
that you were rapidly seeing species evolve. You would see moths within a couple of generations change their pigmentation because their pigment had been designed to blend in against the bark of a tree. And the bark of a tree went from a neutral gray to a black within the course of 20 or 30 years. And you watch the moths literally sort of go through it. It was ugly. It was expensive. It took a long time. But there have been ways to step back. Destruction of ozone is another one where we went awfully far down the road with chlorofluorocarbons and have found ways back. I don't know if we're beyond the point of the way back. I do know that if we decide we're beyond the point of the way back, I think it makes it much harder to start moving in the direction that we need to move in. Mm -hmm. And so for me, in many ways, what I'm finding myself doing is collecting the stories of, of how things are changing. Right now, for me, the, the story that's going to be interesting and, and I predict fairly exciting in the next 20 or 30 years is, is China and industrialization. China knows full well that if they don't figure out how to clean up urban air quality, that's what's going to bring people out into the streets. I didn't mention this, but electricity is what's bringing people to the streets in both Ghana and Nigeria. Um, the, the current president of Ghana is actually a guy I used to work for. Uh, and quite like. Uh, and he's going to be a one-term president. He basically just stood up and said, I accept that if I don't figure out how to save electrical power, I'm going to be a one-term president. You know what? He's going to be a one-term president. Uh, in China, people are going to take to the streets if their kids can't breathe. And that's where they're heading right now. And wealthy parents are now, at incredible expense, building indoor sports fields so that their children can run and play because you can't do it in the streets. But there's a massive middle class that can't afford that. And that at some point is going to provide the pressure. The pressure that had been give us power so that we can have factories and jobs and televisions is now turning into the pressure of give us air that we can breathe. And we know that it can be done because when China was hosting the ASEAN summit, they called off for two weeks everybody burning coal. And a joke that went around Chinese blogs was that the sky was ASEAN blue because people could see blue skies for the first time in 10 years. And it became a joke because it was a matter of political will. If this is what we collectively wanted, this is what we could work to. This is what we could have. So for me, I keep looking for those moments where it looks like we've gone beyond the tipping point, we've gone beyond the point of, of hope, and then in many cases where we turn things back and sometimes turn things back for the better. Um, I don't know what to, to promise you on, on ocean level rise, I don't know what to promise you on CO2 level, I, I'm simply not smart enough in those areas. But I am smart enough about media and narrative to know that the beyond the tipping point is a terrible narrative. There is no good that comes out of that narrative. It is a narrative that lets us off the hook. It's a narrative that lets us hope for Armageddon or apocalypse and sort of hope for what's after that. It's not the narrative we want. The narrative that we want is that we can think about what are those places where we pull back. Please. When I moved out from California, uh, to go through Palm Springs, there were a whole bunch of wind farms and solar panels. I had a question uh, about nuclear reactors, you know, power reactors. Are they less now than about 10, 20 years ago? What's happening on nuclear and now I'm going to defer to a dear friend of mine who studies essentially the composition of the grid. What, what's happening with nuclear is that we have plants going offline and not getting relicensed. Um, we saw this with Yankee Row, just about 18 miles from here. Right. We've seen it with most of the old reactors in New England. They're not getting replaced. There are some interesting open questions. The argument for nuclear 
is that you have low, although not zero emissions. You have lots of mining emissions, and you have terrible fuel storage problems. When you replace it with solar and with wind, what you have is sustainable but really spiky power. And so the problem that we have now is a problem of storage. This is the problem that Germany is starting to have. Germany is investing incredibly heavily in solar. And they have many, many days where they have far more power than the country could possibly use. And so the question becomes, what do you do with it? How do you store it for the cloudy day? How do you store it for the still day? And batteries are terrible. They're, they're, in, in terms of like all the major technologies we sort of use day to day, batteries are the most pathetic, underdeveloped, you know, low-tech solution we have. They just have not changed all that substantively from the 1800s. Uh, and so we do incredibly crazy stuff to store power. We pump water up hills so that when the sun goes down, we can run the water down the hill through a hydro plant at like 98% efficiency and continue generating because that's a better way to make a battery than sort of any other way that we have to make a battery. Right. There's at least two camps. There are people saying nuclear is great. You have it as part of your mix. It gives you continual power, 24 hours. It's a predictable sort of low level. And there are countries like France that have actually gone pretty far down that line. Right. There are other countries essentially saying, look, this isn't a renewable source. It isn't a zero emissions source. It's a source that understandably scares the pants off the people. What we want to figure out is how to get smarter about when we use energy. So here's one way to think about it. If you're in a world where energy is super spiky, right? You've got coal plants, they're predictable but really bad. You've got natural gas plants. You can turn them on and off a lot more easily than coal, so they can be spikier. But they're still pretty bad in terms of emissions. You have solar and wind, which are unpredictable, enormously spiky. Can you somehow find a way to take the things that require enormous amounts of energy and do them at the moment where you have a surplus in power. Can you basically program your house to sort of say, actually, you're not going to dry the clothes right now. You're going to wait until there's a moment where there's a surplus of power on the grid, and then suddenly you're going to dry the clothes. doesn't matter so much with drying the clothes. It matters a lot for smelting aluminum. So these are the sorts of questions that people are now sort of starting to ask. I don't think anyone sees a power system that doesn't have some of that long-term, reliable 24-7 power. The hope is that maybe at some point that's hydro, or that's tidal, or it's sort of something else that we can rely on to be that baseline of the mix. Sure. Um, but there's smart people on both sides of this debate. It's one of those debates where, again, I'm going to claim a sufficient level of ignorance that I'm not going to come down on one side or another. But I will tell you the stuff that I'm excited about are the people who are trying to figure out how to use information and that sort of smart metering and smart usage to try to figure out how you solve the problem. Time for one more, Ethan. Great. Let's go over here. I just follow up that my understanding is that nuclear at this point is considered to be, cradle to grave, one of the most expensive ways to produce energy in terms of setting it up, in terms of mining, the deep shipping, and the it is really fun, by the way, just to go up to Yankee Row and to see that <clears throat> there are these giant buildings there, right? So they've taken down all the things that look like a nuclear reactor. Now what you have are these three-story high buildings um, that basically look like someone opened a bed and breakfast. Uh, only it's the world's worst bed and breakfast because what it is is, is a surrounding around the dry cask storage, right? So it's sort of 60 years of nuclear fuel embedded in concrete because this country hasn't found a way to sort of put the fuel around. I actually had a, 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 some of my students developed a low-cost Geiger counter uh, that actually sort of feeds information to the web. And I thought, hey, what the heck? How often do you get to monitor a nuclear plant? So I drove over to Yankee Row. I took out my Geiger counter. I started walking around trying to get a reading. Good news, by the way, no readings. No radiation coming up. 
the, the interesting news was the group of very friendly men with M1 rifles who met me <laughs> immediately and were very curious about what I was doing. And I explained what I was doing. They explained that while they thought it was a very interesting scientific experiment, Professor, they really hoped I would get back into my truck very, very quickly and get off the facility, which I did. But the thing that sort of reminded me of all of this is we've got a detachment of 20 heavily armed men in Rowe, Massachusetts, maintaining a perimeter around this otherwise beautiful piece of land, which no one is ever going to buy and no one is ever going to build on because we're still trying to figure out the legacy of, of that fuel cycle. And that's a part that I, I don't think we generally think enough about. Ethan, anybody looking at ways to use the interior of the Earth with inexhaustible heat? There's definitely people playing with geothermal. They're mostly playing in places where there's natural venting. A country like Iceland, where you already have very, very good access to it. I think the feeling on geothermal in a country like the US is the funny thing is that we have so much lower hanging fruit. Tidal, in particular, which is extremely predictable. Wind, which we've gotten very, very smart at dealing with. Uh, and solar, and solar is changing so quickly that at this point, if we solve the battery problem, if we solve the storage problem, doing solar simply on a, on a five or 10 X scale that we have right now would, would change the equation radically. Now it's really a storage problem more than anything else. But speaking of problems and running out of resources, time <laughs> is an extremely scarce resource. We have a bishop walking here uh, under his own extremely renewable power. I trust you know now why we invited Ethan Zuckerberg. Yeah.